All right, so this is this recording is for class number one, RPH 140, World Philosophies, Fall 2022. Every recording will be sent to you via email, and it will be also posted on my YouTube channel, which is Martha Catherine with a C Beck PhD philosophy. And so then if you go to that YouTube channel and you look up 2022 fall 140 world philosophies, then you should be able to get to that. And then there's a playlist. That'll be the playlist. And then I'll have class number one. I'll have each class listed in the order. And I'll have the main topic covered for that class. So you can always listen to the videos if you miss the class. And um, and if it's not too complicated, a student tell, should tell me if you can't come to a class the next day or you know you're going to be gone the next week or something. We can meet between the three of us or four of us and decide a different time to meet. So that's, that's the plan for that. Now, do either of you or both of you have a 930 class? Do you have one, Enika? I'm Jig. Okay, what about you, Bradley? I do have a 930 class. Okay. Yeah, I do too. Okay, well, that's good to know because it means we our substitute class can't be right after this class, but we'll see. Um, we'll just check it out when this situation comes. We'll talk about what you'd like to do. Um, all right, let me see if there's any other, any other questions before we even start on the syllabus. Okay. Um, well, I've been teaching a long time and I've been teaching this material. So it's, to me, it's really interesting to see the difference between the world, what the world is like when you teach it 40 years ago and what it's like now, because what you can think about are, well, what are the similarities and what are the differences? Um, now the first, well, actually, usually I assign the students to write their world view. What is your world view? And you have to write about uh, at least 100, 150 words and bring that to class next time. So I talked to Bradley about that because he came yesterday. And um, so Enika, if somebody walked up to you and said, what is your worldview? What do you think you'd say? Besides, well, what's a worldview? And I would say, whatever you want it to be, you decide. Um, what would you say? I don't know. Okay. Well, then the next thing to think about is, do people identify with certain, what do you identify with, right? If you have, if you're on Facebook, do you have a brand? <laughs> right? No. Okay, good. Um, well, some students talk about their faith, or some students talk about their um, choice to, to be a humanist rather than to be religious in any sense. And some just I mean, usually my students come from small towns in Arkansas and their identity is connected to the church they go to, but a church is a worldview. And so 
some students have never paid any attention to what goes on in church. <laughs> and some students, whatever, I'm not, whatever that was. <laughs> and some students sort of embrace it, you know, and they internalize it. But so the idea is just kind of, it, it might be your values. It might be, it just, I like to just let students free associate, whatever it is. How do I think about life? The questions are like, what is life? What is the good life? What, uh, if you're thinking about the historical moment you live in right now, you could think about how did we get here? Uh, where do you wanna go? So another question I have for you is, do you think the country is polarized? What do you think, Enika? You can turn on your mic. Yeah, John. Um, can you repeat that question? Do you think the country is polarized? Do you know the word? No. Okay, well, that's all right. It doesn't matter to me. Actually, it's, it's kind of an advantage in a lot of ways. Um, Bradley, what do you think? I do. I, in fact, I think we are in the middle of some of the most polarized times in our country. Well, yeah, the Civil War was a bit much. <laughs> yes. Well, aside from that, yes. Yeah, no, I, I get it, though, because I went to college actually during the 60s, and that was a time when things were polarized. And I'll tell you that when I went to college at that time, because it's all I knew, it didn't occur to me that it was unique. You know, um, it took a while looking back to see, oh, that wasn't a normal time. <laughs> and also when I raised my kids, all of a sudden my kids, oh, like you don't have to have like riots in the streets in high school. <laughs> there doesn't have to be all this stuff that I went through. Um, so what about Black Lives Matter? Do you guys know about that? Enika, did you follow that at all? Yes, yeah, somewhere, but I don't really watch TV. Okay, so like people weren't, well, that's, I don't watch TV either, so good yeah. for you. I'm yeah, glad. I don't like social media a lot. What? I don't like to be on social media. Well, good for you, Annika. You're going to be a good philosophy student, honestly. <laughs> because, you know, I, I have to compete with that stuff because that's where people think they reflect back. And in Facebook, they don't think that much. They just sort of <laughs> have a, yeah, very good, Annika. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I have you for a student because uh, philosophy is about not getting caught up in that and developing your own worldview apart from that. And that would be the thing from which you act and the reasons why you do what you do. But it's something you work out in your own mind and it's something you work out because you're not, you know, uh, subjecting yourself to all of that immediate um, sense gratification or verbal, I mean, you know, written, uh, oh, I have to think about that. I have, no, you don't, you really don't. <laughs> At the end of the day will come and you'll have reacted to 50 things and you won't remember any of them. So I am glad. I'm glad that you made that choice already. Um, what about you, Bradley? Do you watch a lot of TV? It doesn't seem like it. No, I don't really follow the news, or, and I'm not really big on social media either. Good. <laughs> All right. I haven't watched TV really like 50 years. Um, not very much anyway. Um, all right. So, um, so that I did want to let you know that it, I think it's important for you to know that looking back, you're going to say to yourself, oh, I went to college during this particular era. And it was, you know, unique in a certain way. So there's certain things about college students that have always been true. 
And so when I read Plato's dialogues, I, I was the first time I ever read a book that like resonated with me. Like, this is my life story. You know? like, and that's 2,500 years ago. So there's a part of our minds that is reflecting on the human condition, things that really haven't changed for thousands of years. And that's what often the Bible is actually about that. And the irony is that often it doesn't get read in that more reflective ways. But anyway, so there's the things that don't change. So you're going to be reading materials that are thousands of years old, but I think you'll realize that they speak to you. Like there's a part of your mind that you share with every human being that developed to a certain level reflected on those same questions. And then there's another part of you that's living in the midst of a very particular place and a very particular time in history. So you're in a small town in Arkansas going to college in 2022. And um, during this semester, there's going to be a, a political a vote, right? And that'll people will de be deliberating about that a lot. Um, I don't I don't really want you to be that engaged personally. I mean, you you do whatever you want, but I definitely not implying that you should be very informed about the latest blah blah. I really think that's not good for your mind. <laughs> Um, but I think we will, I will bring in articles from the news over the past, I don't know, 20 years or so, just to give you a sense that this material does relate to contexts that people are in. Um, one, one thing I will do is I'll bring in a lot of articles from the George W. Bush era. That was right after 9-11. Um, because I saved a lot of material from that time because I knew that was such a watershed time. But I didn't teach very much of it at the time because the students were so emotionally invested in it and they would have emotional reactions. But I thought if I wait another five years or so, then the students can read it and it's close enough in time that they could understand this is about me or this is what my parents somebody you know a lot of americans that you see and interact with a lot of your mentors they live through this time and just to reflect on how our country reacted to that and also how um editorial writers were talking about we have a choice we can choose to react this way or we can choose to react that way. It's very important to me that you understand human beings have choice and countries, nations have choices and it affects their history. The things you do now affect your future, but they also affect the society, right? So every personal choice you make has, has ramifications, it has ripple effects for society and part of society is politics, but not, not as much as I would hope. I, I think people make a bigger deal of the politics than they should because I, I would not like to get dedicate my life to trying to get people to vote one way or the other because what matters is why they're voting in other one way, right? How do they see the world? How do they see political life? What are they looking for in a political leader? How do they see a healthy society? What do you think a healthy society is? What do you think a healthy person is? Um, and that's one of the questions we ask. I think it's for next the next class, actually. What makes a society great? 
Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard anybody say, America is so great, or make America great again, right? Okay, I'll write off the top of your head. What do you think that means? Uh, Enika, what makes a society great? Or what would make America great? Give me, give me your first reaction. Um, you said, like, can you repeat that one more time? Sorry. Oh, what what makes a nation great, right? If we're gonna make America great again, what the heck is great? And why were we greater in the past than we are now? Like, what the heck? You know what I mean? I don't I mean, think. I don't think it was ever great. Okay, <laughs> why not? It just, it just, not. I don't know how to explain it. All right. I mean, what about the legacy of slavery? Yeah, but I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> that's okay. I brought it up. <laughs> okay. Well, that's one of the main reasons why. Okay, good. I mean, um, maybe as an African American, you think, oh boy, I don't want to bring this up, but I'll bring it up, right? It's okay with me. Um, my, fa my father marched with Martin Luther King when I was in fifth grade. So, and I remember that very vividly. I don't know if you've read about Selma, Alabama. Um, anyway, so so he was prominent in the civil rights movement. So I do want to say that um, I've been I've been following a lot of this stuff. The Black Lives Matter, you know, the big riot. There was a big a big event in the Twin Cities, close to where George Floyd was killed. I don't know if you know that, but it was in the news like crazy. It was two blocks from the high school where my daughters went to school. So, I mean, I'm, I'm invested, you know, but it's not like if you're native, if you're African-American, like that's totally different. Um, you have, you have that legacy that you live with. Um, but anyway, so what about you, Bradley? What, what do you think makes America or any nation, what makes any country great what does that mean so the problem with that question is um what people define as great ah, it, you got it, it it changes based on each person it's subjective well i mean you can make arguments though right yes absolutely you can make arguments but at the end of the day each person is just going to have a different opinion of what's great and what isn't Although there can be some things that you agree on. All right. So is having an empire and controlling the world, is that what makes you great? Or does being committed to diplomacy and trying to have a balance of power between the countries, making an effort to do that, does that make a society great? I would say the second one makes you great, but that is just my my opinion. Somebody else might say, you know, to control all the nations would make you great, but, yeah, but I don't agree okay. with that. Good. So is there any uh, foundation for arguing for one over the other? For example, are we all equally human? Right? Right. Well, if we're all equally human, I don't know, Bradley, do you think people have a certain basic foundational similarity they do ah but if you think that does that i mean which which way of running the world comes closer to the truth about human life and it's a very fair argument okay you understand then that you yes. can have an argument if what you're working with is humanity and we're all basically equal than to want to build an empire and control everybody else is a lie, right? It's based on a false view and it's, it's going to do harm and it's gonna cause unnecessary suffering. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and that's just to give you an idea that it is very popular to think it's all relative and everybody has their opinion. But I, you know, I wanna argue that if people are by nature equal, it's not a matter of opinion. 
trying to be diplomatic is closer to the truth. I mean, you can fail, uh, but to refuse to try is to base your life on a lie. And that, you know, that's the watershed. That's the difference between a philosopher and a sophist, you know, a, a person. It's the difference between being healthy and being corrupt, um, choosing good or evil. But that's just something for you to think about, that you can find good and evil in the midst of all the um, subjectivity. Um, sometimes people think something is objectively true, and I, I would think that, no, they got the wrong principle or they have the wrong you know, reason for this or that. So it's, it's not cut and dried, but I do think the part of the class is your own search for the truth and what is true and what is just and what is virtue, trying to cut through the crap <laughs> and figure out, you know, can I develop a worldview that I think really is closer to what's actually the fact or actually out there but societies are very complicated and um, ambiguous and we make mistakes it's not clear cut I don't think you're ever going to get ah now I got it and I can live my life <laughs> no that's not true um, let me give you one other example when I was in high school I didn't like all the drama that went on, you know, all the emotional stuff. But I thought in my head, you know, people will grow out of this eventually, right? Like they'll get to college or whatever, and they'll grow up. And then, you know, I'll be able to relate to people better. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, step back. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I hate to disappoint you, but I think in college, you just sort of decide what you want to live for and you develop your sense of agency but some people really never grow up <laughs> they're still in high school and they do that their whole lives like whatever chip on their shoulder they had in high school or whatever basic drive they had for money or for power or for popularity for attention or for pleasure or or if they're serious, um, there's a lot of grown-ups that haven't really grown up. Um, does that occur to any of you? Uh, yes. Well, there is a quote by uh, Walt Disney: "Adults are only kids grown up." Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that's what you know. It's interesting because sometimes you think when you say somebody's acting like a two-year-old. I mean, sometimes it's an insult to a two-year-old because <laughs> some two-year-olds are actually more mature than some adults. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So when you say kids grown up, you know, that doesn't mean they're all immature necessarily because um, it's kind of an insult to kids. Um, there are kids that really do try, you know, to be kind and empathetic and there are adults that don't. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, that's a problematic issue. Um, and I guess the notorious case is in the nursing home, old folks homes, where some single man moves in and you have the potluck brigade. <laughs> and so all these women are just sort of flirting with them. And I mean, it's just like high school junior high it's kind of crazy right so um there's a part of our psyche that is pretty immature pretty basic pretty primitive and close to the brain stem and we can have these pretty extreme reactions and we can also just live in fantasy worlds starting as a teenager like the rest of your life or you can grow up now what is growing up and that's philosophy deals with questions like that what is wisdom um and what is justice what is truth 
So let me just start with the syllabus then. Um, okay. Now, let me know if you have any questions. This, I realize that it's annoying at the beginning to have to scroll all the way down. But the reassuring thing is, you know, the whole class is right there. And so you can go to the whole class at any point in time and you can see everything that was covered. And also like if you are, if you're writing your paper and you remember a quote from one of the uh, attachments, all you do is scroll down, you can find the attachment. So, um, all right, so let's go to the syllabus and you can ask me whatever it is you wanna ask. Here we go. Now, Enika, have you bought the texts, the books required for the class? No, ma'am. Did you know there were books required? No, ma'am. I haven't checked the syllabus. I just, I was really late getting into my stuff. Okay. Well, I think I, I, or I put them on the online bookstore too. But here are the books, and um, you can. Buy them used. Some of them you have to buy used, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> it's not an expensive class. Um, Bradley bought the books, and I don't know, Bradley. Do you remember how much the whole class added up to? Well, it was. It's kind of hard for me to calculate because uh, my order was combined with books from other classes. Okay. Okay. But. Um, if I had to say, it would definitely be less than $100 for all the books in this class. Yeah, I think it's more like 60 actually. But anyway, no problem. All right, so here's the plan. We're going to meet Tuesday, Thursdays from 8 to 9.15. Now, there's going to have to be a few adjustments. And next Tuesday, for example, I think I'm, I'm flying out to Indonesia on Monday morning. And there's this day, you know, the international timeline. And <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I'll be able to be somewhere at eight o'clock at night to, to get online. But I will tape the class and I'll actually tape it um, early this weekend or the weekend before. And then it's possible that I'll be able to get on. But if not, there'll be a long lecture and we can meet the following Thursday. So for this week, we're online. For next week, we're in person. For the following week, I'm not quite sure about Tuesday, but I think we're good to go after that. Um, feel free to email me whenever you like. And um, I have... Okay, so both of you have a class after this class, so that's not a good time for office hours, but you can do appointments and we might be able to agree on certain standard times that work for you. But for the most part, my class obviously is small enough that you can always get a hold of me. That's the main thing. Um, now, the description, I think that the description should also be including humanism because we talk about Western humanism. We talk about Greek humanism, ancient humanism. We talk about modern humanism. Um, and so that, and the reason why it's called world philosophies, but it has these traditions that are connected to religion is because the labeling these, these worldviews religions was a denigration based on colonialism. So when the Westerners went and colonized countries that were indigenous Hindu, Buddhist, Confucian, they deliberately put those traditions in a box and called them religions because then they could separate, they could say, well, we're Christian and they're Hindu and we're better 
because we have all this advanced science and you know we're it was racism <laughs> and so i'm pushing back on that because those traditions are about a way of life and humanism also is about a way of life but the the modern humanist tradition insists on modern western science as the only foundation for a worldview. And I want to push back on that and say, there's a lot of other ways to look at stuff. And um, modern Western science is starting to rethink some of its assumptions. And many, many people trained in a modern Western science worldview are reconsidering it and starting to realize that, well, actually those Hindus knew something and the Buddhists had some, you know, and Confucian, they have something to offer us about the questions of virtue, justice, and truth and wisdom. So that's why I'm doing it this way. Um, so Bradley has said that if, 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 and this is true of Enika, if you really are more of a humanist, then I will tailor the class. We'll just talk more about whatever the assignment is through the filter of a humanist. So the class is small enough that students can guide the discussion. I like, I like to have like, here's the basic readings, but every single time I teach the class, it's different because the students are different. And the the things that mean something to them is different. And so I sort of tailor the lecture, but they will come with the reactions. I mean, it will, it's a creative process. So that's what we're going to do. Um, now, there's all the, always the student learning outcomes. I'm sure you go through this every first day of class, but it's just readings. Um, you know what the author intended, the under, you see, understand the argument, you use a theory, show it how it can be applied, you can analyze what's missing. So you can synthesize different points of view. Um, so you can take something like Hinduism and say, well, this is its strength and this is its weakness. You can link Hinduism to Confucianism, if you want, it's just sort of creatively understanding what they say and then reflecting on it and then linking it to the other things we've covered in the class. Um, and eventually embracing it or not as you create your own view. Then we have papers and what I'm going to ask, you know, in a paper, this is standard, I think. You have a clear thesis statement, you support it with arguments, you have premises and conclusions, you have textual references, you're fair to the positions that you're arguing against, and you have a, critic a well reasoned criticism, or you have a strong argument for what you accept. Um, you have good paragraphs and all of that. So that's I think standard stuff for college papers. Um, you communicate your ideas orally. So we don't have small groups because the class is too small, but every day you read the material before class and you come with three questions or comments or something that you want the people in the rest of the class to discuss. Um, something you want to focus on. So always read the material with your own mind in mind. What do I think of this? What do I want to be pursued more during the class? Um, and then there's conferences. Now, you don't have to have a conference with me again, because the class time is going to have so much one on one time that that's that's not required. Um, the content of your papers, that the thesis statements are complex, creative. Um, they show that you've thought about the material. 
you'll relate it to something going on around the world. Um, it'll show the power of ideas and the power of history. Um, and it, it'll show the importance of having good ideas, right? It matters that you have ideas and that they're good ideas. So my view as a philosopher is that ideas are really powerful and ideas drive people. Um, as, you know, there's lots of theories about what drives people, like someone will say, fear drives people. And I will say, no, it's not the fear, it's people's ideas <laughs> about their fears. What drives people is what do they think the cause of the fear is? And what do they think the cure to get over the fear is? That's what drives them, not the fear itself. So that's why reflecting on your emotions, reflecting on your actions is really important because that determines um, your behavior and also your overall character. Over time, what is it that motivates you? What ideas, what arguments? Um, then in, in the religion and philosophy program at Lyon, we link reason, some notion of reason. It can be your own reasoning, like you start with a set of assumptions and you show what, what you can conclude, or um, science, physical science, or biological science, or social science, uh, social psychology, uh, individual psychology, so the whole thing about psychology and um, economics. So all this kind of reasoning that you get in your classes, and then the notion of faith. Now, faith can mean a religious tradition, but in a philosophy class, it means your idea of flourishing, your idea of the human good or the good. <laughs> Maybe it's not human but your idea of what makes life worth living um, and how you would know a, a healthy society or a good political leader or a good person, like how do you understand that? Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of reasoning and arguments and in the RPH program, every class and every day of every class has kind of a different view of reason, faith, and the relationship between them. And the mission of Lyon College, this is, this is really important to me, is um, that you have these characteristics of a liberal mind, an educated mind. Um, and this is in the catalog, intellectual honesty, like you're honest, about what you know and what you don't know. <laughs> this is hard, okay? That's not trivial, it's very difficult. Your commitment to truth, like I indicated earlier, that you can find truth somewhere in the midst of all the muddle, uh, but it's not gonna be an absolute truth that doesn't change. It's just that you can recognize that our basic equality is more fundamental than all the ways that societies construct inequalities. So when societies construct inequalities, it's a lie and it creates tension in a society, things like that. Um, fairness to opposing points of view, that's very important because that's the way to overcome or to prevent polarization. Patience with complexity and ambiguity because life is complex and um, choices that you make are ambiguous. They aren't always black and white, cut and dried. I think that college is a time when you can actually start to think pretty deeply and seriously about the fact that people have different points of view, that life is complicated and that we should, as an adult, you should always try to live with those complexities and always try to figure out what's going on. 
and then tolerance of reasoned dissent, like somebody disagrees with you, but you tolerate. Um, all right, the content is intercultural knowledge. Uh, we will be creating the history, right? You're literally creating your own history as you develop your worldview because you're going to start acting on the basis of it more and more. Um, you engage in, in integrative learning. You understand the relationship between aspects of culture. So we'll talk about not just Confucius analects, but Chinese culture, how it affected the culture, um, how you want to live. You start to just think more about that. Um, make more informed decisions about ethical reasoning, um, and then make decisions about civic engagement. So maybe at, when the class is done, you'll have a little more understanding this does not mean, you know, you'll join a political party or get involved in a, an election at all. Um, the reason why I went into philosophy is that I thought if people are ungovernable, if people's habits of living and thinking makes them incapable of being governed because <laughs> they don't want to care about other people, it doesn't really matter who wins an election. Um, so it's important to create a kind of society where political life is about people who care about other people <laughs> and they want to think about other citizens and how to move the country forward. Because you have to have that kind of quality of society before you can have a decent political um, realm, right, before the politicians are actually going to be able or willing to, to lead the country in a, in a positive way. OK, um, my strategy is to educe that draw you out. Like, I want you to know that you are capable of thinking about the serious questions, and you actually do it. In the back of your mind, you've been doing it for a while, but for a lot of Oh my goodness, for a lot of people, um, it's not socially acceptable to sit and talk to your buddies in the middle of your the hallway in high school about some serious question. <laughs> so, um, but in the back of your mind, our minds are always trying to make sense of what goes on around us. And so, um, so this class just gives you a chance to sort of bring that what's sort of subconscious into your consciousness. And my job is to draw it out, pull it out of you. Um, now, attendance, there is a just a standard <clears throat> requirement. If you, meet, if you miss over um, uh, four weeks of class, that would be eight classes in a Tuesday, Thursday class. And if you miss that many classes, there's trouble. I mean, you flunk. <laughs> so here's my policies about um, excused and unexcused absences. Um, and I have all these policies. You, you need to notify me by 6 p.m. Um, all right. And here's how the grade will be affected or could be affected. So I make these rules. But I, I make my own decisions. I can break my own rules. It's just that if I actually follow my own rules, you can't you know, feel you've been mistreated. So I will either follow my own rules or I'll be more lenient. But I'll make sure the student, you know, if they know what the rules are, then they can, they'll know um, why they got a lower grade based on unexcused absences. So if you miss a whole week unexcused, right? Or, or two weeks, you know, it's pretty lenient. Um, and then it goes on from there. Okay, so the goal is to be engaged. So you have to have read it before class. That's kind of, because you're not going to be able to go and listen to a lecture and the teacher won't ever know if you read it or not. That's not going to be how it works. Um, Right from the beginning, I asked students, well, what, 
did you want to talk about? And this class is a safe space. I don't know if you've ever heard the expression safe space, but it's a space where you um, can talk about controversial ideas and everybody listens to people and we don't allow anything to separate us because we actually want to understand each other's ideas. And that's how I feel when I see people on the street. I just wish I could sit down and talk to them and find out, you know, um, what narrative, what story do they have in their mind about what's going on in our country, about not just political life. I mean, that's the thing that's the most polarized, but just anything. And if you just start out asking somebody, what do you think? And then you start having a conversation that's based on reasoning and thinking and reflecting. I really think deep down inside, everybody needs to do that and is much happier if they know the people they see in the street would be happy to sit down and have a conversation with them. That would change our country quite a bit rather than looking at a person and thinking you don't trust them and thinking they disagree with you know you and that's it's really awful <laughs> and you can't have a democracy that way so i want my class to be um a dialogue it's a mini democracy where everybody gets a chance to talk um all right so you start, um, again, because the class is so small, I assign you that you have to write three things before class that you want to comment on or questions that you have. And we'll probably get to all three for each one of you. Okay, then there's tardy issues. Then there's <clears throat> written assignments. All right. Every Friday at three o'clock, you have a post due. And that consists of 150 words for each class. So the post itself would have at least 300 words because you put them together. There are three parts for each day. First, while you're reading the assignment, you write down three questions or comments. Then after you write down your reaction, um, then, after the class, you have three comments about what was said during class that was interesting to you. And then you write, is there anything from this class that I think I might want to put in my worldview? Because that's your final paper. So you're constantly building your understanding of the world. So, um, all right, and we'll look at the due dates and, and all that stuff. I've got all that posted. Um, all right, and then the final paper is, what is my worldview? And here's the grading for if you're late with your papers. Again, I can be more lenient, but you will understand if the grade is lower. And it's important that you know that it's if you had reasons for handing it in late, that's fine. I'm pretty lenient about that. Um, if you're considering majoring or minoring, keep a portfolio, make a file with your original worldview, one other paper in the final, okay? Now I recommend RPH. Of course, every teacher recommends their discipline, but not as a major so much, as a minor. There's six classes, and if you like this class, and if you like that kind of reflective thinking, if you just take you know, one class a semester, um, you can get a minor in it pretty easily. All right, I did try to organize the class so that you give me two hours of study per hour of class. And um, I know that most students don't study that much, but I, I owe, right? You owe it to me. So you can't say you're giving us too much reading. I would say, well, is it too much for two hours per hour of class? Or is it just more than your schedule can handle? And I know a lot of my students have very tight schedules. 
I know that sports takes a lot of time, but it is a college, right? It's an academic institution. And so that's what you owe me. <laughs> and if the readings truly take more than two hours, you don't ha have to read absolutely everything. Um, but I did try to design it so that it's fair. Then this is the shorter assignment. So the posts, you have 10 posts. There are a total of 13 of them on the website, on the gradebook, but three of those are extra credit. So if you want to skip a post one week, like the third week, there's an extra credit post number 11. And so overall, I'll just, each post counts for five points. That's 50 points. Then there's three papers. Each one of those is 10 points. And the final paper. Um, the honor code policy is when you're citing a website, use the address and the day you used it. You can ask librarians if there's any questions. I'm not going to know enough to point out some tiny little thing that, um, that you did wrong about a citation. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not into that, um, but so you, I don't think you have to worry about it too much. When citing a book or article, include a complete reference on a works cited page, right? If that's, um, if, if it's a book or article from outside the class, if it's something from in the class, uh, like the Houston Smith book, all you have to do is say Smith page so-and-so, or you can name the attachment. Um, and Schoology files, should say uh, Google Classroom files, but it's the same, right? You just cite the name of the attachment. Um, then when you quote from somewhere, just acknowledge that this isn't your idea, that it's you got the idea from somewhere else. So that's plagiarism. If you steal someone's idea and you don't give them credit, um, collaboration, you can meet with people outside of the class. Again, the class is so small, it's probably not an issue. Here's the harassment, discrimination, sexual misconduct, and that's in every syllabus. The last day to drop without record and the last day to drop with a W as opposed to an F. Um, now, does anyone have questions on that? All right, here is, I'll just give you a, oh yeah, okay. A quick run. This is just a quick list of all the attachments for each class because I, I have a standard. So you can sort of anticipate. But the reason I put that here is as the course proceeds, I will scroll through this once in a while to remind you like we're, we might be on Confucianism, Confucianism, and then I'll go back and say, well, how does that compare to like Martin Luther King? Or how does that compare to, to humanism? And how does that compare to something we've done before? So that's why I have that list of attachments there. Because in this class, everything is connected to everything else. Um, because we live in this one world, but we interpret it many, many different ways. So I'm always trying to get you to have a sense of the whole. It's basically the same subject matter. And then the way that it gets talked about is so different that your mind gets directed in one way rather than another. Um, here's the paper rubric. Um, so here's I look what I look for. Thesis statement, arguments, uh, the premises, the the inference, what conclusions do you draw from the premises, the textual references, um, the examples, um, the counter arguments, um, what, what's the best argument against my argument, 
um, with the examples. Don't spend too much time talking about it or too little. Just show me how your example proves your point. Um, the paragraphs, each paragraph has a topic, the grammar, uh, the quality of the paper as a whole. This is this was right in the syllabus too. How the how what you're writing applies to something, like it matters if somebody thinks one way or another way. And then the RPH, the liberally minded person and reason and faith. Um, all right, then after you write your paper, you're gonna present uh, your main ideas, what you said in the paper, you give a presentation of that. So you have, um, you discuss your thesis and then you explain how you argued it and you have to show that you know the subject matter and you just have to speak, you have to deliver it in a good way. Um, all right, any, and this one has, well, that, you know, if both of you are more humanistic, we don't have to talk about uh, that. This one is about students who come to college with certain religious convictions and their attitudes toward that. I suppose some are drifters. They don't, they're not really interested. Some students already sort of defend what they grew up with. Some actually are willing to reconsider what they grew up with or what they know so far. And then some really want to forge a path forward. They want to create something that they care about a lot. Um, let's see. Any other questions on that? No. So now I'll just talk a little bit about what we're going to cover next time. So you can anticipate the, re the reading. There's not a lot of reading for next time. Um, all right. We will start out with the Greeks, ancient Greek culture. And um, Let's see, we'll start out with talking about the Olympian deities. So how many, did either of you ever read about the Greek gods when you were younger? I did briefly, but it was very long ago. Okay, that's okay. What about you, Annika? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't read that until like high school. What? I, we read something similar to that in high school. Okay, well, anyway, I'll just talk about it, um, the God of justice. And so we talk about, well, what is justice, right? How does, what is, okay, so the idea is that we, each of you is engaged with lots of different relationships in lots, lots of different kinds of social groups. So the most basic one is the family. That's how you survive, right? Your immediate family. And so there's family relationships. Then you start to reach out. You start to expand to broader. You have school. The schools have a mission. Schools are institutions. They have a mission. When you engage in a school, when you're acting like a student or a teacher, you're fulfilling a certain purpose. Uh, churches have a mission and a purpose. When you meet with people there, that social group is based on that idea of the good. There might be other clubs that you're in. Just whatever experiences you've had in your social life, each one of those connections has a purpose. That's why the institution exists. It's meeting some sort of human need. And so you think about that. You think about how they relate to each other. And then this, then you have economic life, the people that you're connected to because of exchange, um, economic exchange, people who work in retail stores or grocery stores, whatever. That's the economic realm. And then the political realm 
is when you're thinking about what sort of laws should we make that apply to every citizen. And this applies to people you don't know, that you've never met. So it takes a higher level of abstract thinking. You have to think of yourself as a human being and as a citizen and what bonds you with other American citizens or other people living in America, that sort of connection. So you can think about what sort of laws should we have, what, and then how should they be applied and how should they be enforced? Um, and those are questions that are very important. Those are questions that get discussed in the newspaper a lot. How do we negotiate with other countries, foreign policy? So those are political questions because they deal with us as citizens living together under a common body of laws. So that's what Zeus is, the God of justice. And then there's a woman. So there's a male and a female for each of these. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, justice, and war, but only a just war, not unjust war. Poseidon is the God of the sea. So this idea is that there's certain things about the natural world that human beings do not control. And if you, if you try to defy the sea, if you try to pretend um, when, the, when the Greeks were going to war against Troy, they're, all they're thinking of is kicking you know, Trojan butt, like winning a war. Well, it turns out <laughs> the, the winds don't blow and they're all stuck because they can't get over there in their ships. And on the way back, the winds blow so hard, every, they get shipwrecked. So, I mean, you have to factor in these natural forces and human beings can't control them. I'm sorry, you have to have a worldview where you factor in your vulnerability. And then the, for Demeter, the female is the goddess of fertility, the goddess of the earth. And we're destroying the, the earth, right? And so that's hubris. We're overstepping our bounds. We're, um, we're, we're violating Demeter and she's mad at us. <laughs> So she's the god of fertility of the earth and human fertility. So I think we're in a phase where we're acting very arrogantly. Um, Hades is the god of the underworld. And the thing to think about there is what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind? And Persephone is the goddess where she'll punish you if you, um, if you victimize people in this world, you're going to get victimized after. So this is kind of the hellfire and brimstone uh, puritanical one, but there's 11 others. So that's not the only one. Apollo is the god of reason. Um, Artemis is the opposite. That's her twin. They're twins. She's the goddess of the wilderness, the hunt. Ares is the god of war. Um, and he just likes to go show how macho he is. <laughs> His sword He's a double-edged sword, like his desire to prove his courage in the face of danger causes people to get killed on both sides. Um, Hera is the goddess of honor. Um, Dionysus is the god of wine. Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Hephaestus. And so Aphrodite, okay, Dionysus and Aphrodite are... Um, sex and drinking, right? Pleasure, immediate sensuous pleasure, but that's okay. Nothing in the Greeks is bad. There's no, no guilt. They're all part of life and they're incorporated into life. Uh, Hephaestus, the god of the forge, he's um, the artisan. And Hestia is the god of the heart, the reflective one. Hermes is the messenger of the gods. He sends the messages from Olympus down. Now, I will tell you, next time we'll start out with some stories about these deities to give you a sense that they actually, you know, they're about life. They're not just about these weird, you know, the weird Greek religion. They're actually tapping into the collective unconscious in a way that uh, helps you understand life. And it's trying to educate you, actually. So um, 
all you have to read for next time, here's a timeline of Greece, um, sort of what goes, this is just eyeballing it and thinking about things like de Greek democracy, right? That's why we study it. And so I do want you to spend some time looking at this outline and thinking about it, comparing Greek history with US history, reading about Socrates a bit and comparing Socrates and Jesus, Plato and Plato's dialogues. So try to try to just get, get as much as you can out of looking at that outline. And then here's the, I'll give you a lecture about the rise and fall of Athenian democracy. And I'll play the role of Plato and I'll explain to you what Plato loved about his culture and then the agonizing way that he watched it destroy itself. So it's about a, a democracy, a society that was set up to really encourage people to think like citizens and to participate in public life and how they destroyed it. And so he's writing these stories to tell you, don't do what we did. <laughs> he's trying to uh, warn us. He, he knew that he lived through a certain time in a certain place. He watched democracy destroy itself in 30 years. And he thought, you know, everyone who is smart enough and privileged enough to read my dialogues has a choice. They can abuse their privilege and their intelligence, or they can use it to promote human well being. So they can use it to destabilize their society and uh, trigger a rise of authoritarianism, or they can use it to promote democracy and try to nurture stability and a strong middle class. So that's where we're going. And so for next time, I want you to just scroll through those outlines. I have some questions on the stream. Um, so questions like, what makes a country great? Uh, why do you think Americans still study the Greeks? Uh, what do you know about the Greeks? What do, you, what do you think makes a society great and what makes it corrupt? What is it about America that makes it great or corrupt? So, um, so there's two things, write your worldview and then write answers to that question. So any questions about that? All right, so I'll let you go. Um, I'll see you on Thursday, okay? Okay. Bye-bye, Annika. <laughs>